Good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to welcome you to a special Wednesday afternoon lecture because this is the Margaret Pittman Lecture, a special lecture given once a year to honor Margaret Pittman. She was the first woman laboratory chief at the National Institutes of Health, appointed to that position in 1957 after a distinguished career uh, here at NIH and in other places like Rockefeller, uh, where she was very much a pioneer in the area of infectious disease. In fact, Dr. Pittman was the first to establish a capsular type B of Haemophilus influenzae as one of six types of H. influenzae most responsible for childhood meningitis, setting the stage uh, for subsequent efforts, some of them done here which have now led to a remarkable decline in the incidence of that terrible disease because of the availability of a vaccine. All you can connect the, the story back to Margaret Pittman's work in the 1930s. Uh, she also worked on Salmonella typhi. Uh, she worked out another particular bacterium, uh, Haemophilus aegyptius, that was responsible for epidemic conjunctivitis and uh, developed uh, another set of observations that were important uh, in vaccines. So we, every year, uh, choose someone, and the choice comes from the advice of the scientific directors at NIH and on the recommendation of the NIH Women Scientist Advisors, an individual to come and deliver the Margaret Pittman Lecture who follows in that tradition uh, of being a remarkable woman scientist leader. And today, uh, we are very fortunate that that role is being played uh, by Professor Bonnie Berger, who is Professor of Applied Mathematics and Computer Science at MIT and Associate Member of the Broad Institute. Bonnie got her undergraduate degree at Brandeis and then went off to MIT to get a PhD and has been there ever since, uh, going through uh, a career with a PhD uh, a postdoctoral fellowship also at MIT, and then since 1992 on the faculty uh, ra rather rapidly advancing from assistant to associate uh, to full professor where she is now. Uh, along the way, uh, she's been honored by an NSF career award, by the Biophysical Society's Dayhoff Award for Research, and uh, being chosen as a fellow of the Association for Computing Mach Machinery in 2004. Uh, her work is very timely uh, for us uh, here at NIH as we are all struggling uh, with the wonderful problem of having too much data, uh, big data as it's uh, featured on the cover of Nature magazine, big data as we talk about around the table at institute director meetings on Thursday mornings, big data as I'm even now being asked uh, by people in the White House, what are you going to do about this uh, since everybody recognizes that we are in a circumstance of needing to be very thoughtful and creative about how we handle the very large quantities of biological data uh, that are pouring out of many different approaches based upon genomics and other approaches uh, to understanding how life works and how disease occurs. So we certainly need individuals uh, who are extremely creative in putting together algorithms that will assist us in mining the nuggets out of this very large sea of information. And uh, we could not have a better person uh, to describe some of the approaches that are currently being done in that regard and uh, who is a leader herself in that effort than today's speaker. So uh, her, her presentation today is called Computational Biology in the 21st Century, Making Sense Out of Massive Data. Please join me in welcoming Professor Bonnie Berger. Good afternoon. Um, Dr. Collins almost took some of my introduction, but that's fine. <laughs> anyway, the mission of our field is to answer biological and biomedical questions by using computation in support of or in place of laboratory procedures, with one goal being to get more accurate answers at a greatly reduced cost. We are currently generating massive data sets so massive that without smart algorithms, we won't be able to effectively analyze these to discover patterns that might provide clues to the underlying biological processes. Throughout my talk, 
there will be a common theme of taking a macroscopic view or picture of all this data through which we can view problems as disparate as high throughput genomics, medical genomics, and biological networks. But there's a big challenge here. As Dr. Collins said, the size of these databases are growing astronomically. The good news is we have lots of data in which to look for these patterns and signals. The bad news is the problems threaten to become computationally intractable due to the sheer enormity of the databases. Things were bad enough when I started back in this area around 1995. Back then, the size of GenBank was about half a million sequences. The PDB had about 3,800 protein structures, and SwissProt had about 50,000 protein sequences. We were then able to use this data to predict coil coils from sequence using pairwise residue correlations. And things have gotten worse at an incredible rate. Recently, there's been an exponential explosion in the amount of sequencing data. Now, it is true that computers have gotten a lot faster and also more cost effective. As you can see in the green log scale plot here, the amount of processing you can do per dollar of compute hardware has been more or less doubling every year, known as Moore's Law. Back in the 1990s, this was enough to keep, to keep up with the pace of sequencing data, which is shown in blue here. But look what happened after the advent of next-gen sequencing. The sizes of these databases have been grow growing by a factor of 10 every year. Now, in the past, we would deal with such problems by saying future computers will be fast enough. But clearly, that's not the case. So this is a big problem and a challenge for the field. So much so that there's been a recent New York Times article, and also many others, <laughs> identifying this kind of a problem. In fact, they point out that Beijing's BGI, the largest genome sequencing center in the world, is generating so much sequencing data that it has overwhelmed their internet connection. They also point out that it costs more to analyze a genome than to sequence it now. Now, it's tempting to think that cloud computing will solve this problem, as this article itself suggests. But that's simply not the case. It may save some cost, but it doesn't address the fundamental issue. That is, it doesn't change the problem that sequencing data is growing exponentially faster than computing power per dollar. So the only thing that will address this issue are fundamentally better algorithms to process these data sets. And better algorithms can make an enormous difference. In fact, we need algorithms so fast that in some cases, they don't e their um, running time does not even grow linearly with the size of the data. And that's what we do. We design algorithms that do these kind of calculations really fast and scale so that their cost doesn't explode as the size of the databases increase. Another thing we do is design algorithms to take advantage of these massively growing data sets to get new biological insights. So designing efficient algorithms for processing massive data is what allows us to produce software that can answer some important biomedical questions in practice. So in this talk, I'll speak about three instances where we have massive amounts of data and how we're responding to the challenge of analyzing it. I'll talk about one challenge in large-scale genomics one challenge in medical genomics, and one in network biology. In all three of these cases, the spotlight will be on how better algorithms can make these problems more tractable and allow us to gain insights we otherwise would not have been able to gain. First, let's focus on large-scale genomics. So currently, many genomics applications require us to store access and analyze very large libraries of sequence data. 
But given the growth of such data that I just described, we have to wonder if even our fastest algorithms can keep pace. Clearly, if we just want to store the data, we could compress it, which some have done. But merely compressing the data is not going to solve all of our problems because eventually we have to look at it. So the key here is that much of the quote unquote new data is actually similar. So the question becomes, how can we take advantage of this redundancy in our algorithms that store and our algorithms that process this data at the same time? We call this compressive genomics. So notice that in the original scenario here, we compress the data and then decompress it to analyze it. Whereas with compressive genomics, we compress the data and then operate directly on the compressed data with no need to decompress. Now, in the algorithms community, which I'm from, this is what's known as succinct data structures for the case of exact matching. However, in our field, things are rarely exact. So as it turns out, we have databases out there such as Flybase and Wormbase that hold data for many closely related and not so closely related species. And the Thousand Genomes Project is generating lots and lots of highly similar human sequence data. So how similar is this data? Well, here's an illustration of a subtree of the fly phylogeny. And the amount of non-redundant data for each level of the tree is in black and the individual genomes are colored. So if you look up here at just Desimulans and Desichelia, you see that the amount of non-redundant data is half the size of their total database. And you would expect that for a collection of highly similar genomes, you could get that the amount of non-redundant data was roughly proportional to just one of those genomes. So how we make use of this redundancy is at the heart of compressive genomics. So we have a number of application areas for compressive genomics, and I'm not going to be able to get into them today, but you should be able to see them in print shortly. But the key in every one of these application areas is that the runtime is proportional to the non-redundant information that we have in the collection of genomes we consider, rather than the full data set. So I've just talked about how sublinear time algorithms, I didn't really mention, but it's true, they were sublinear time because they scale with the amount of non-redundant data rather than the full data set, can help us um, manage the enormous growth in biological data. So now what I'm going to do is talk about how we can gain better biomedical insights from large-scale data. And I've been asked to mention that this is impress at PNAS and under their embargo policy. So in the old days, if you were interested in some disease, say breast cancer, you would at great expense map the gene expression profiles for a variety of genes onto an expression array to look for patterns of interest. In the lab next door, someone might be doing the same thing for, let's say, colon cancer but you would have no way to combine and integrate these separate discoveries. All this has now changed. We now have databases such as NCBI's Gene Expression Omnibus, or GEO, which pulls together many disparate gene expression studies. So now, because computers are much faster and cost less, and we have lots and lots of these gene expression studies publicly available, we are no longer confined to the tens of samples we can generate in our own wet lab. But now, as I'll show you in this talk, we've been able to analyze thousands of gene expression samples to derive novel biological or meaningful biological insights. And more importantly, many of these insights can only be gleaned by looking at hundreds of thousands or tens of thousands of gene expression samples at the same time. So I've just shown you a plot of the whole GEO database. And as you saw, it consisted of hundreds of thousands of samples and was intrinsically higher dimensional. 
So now what we're going to do is look at a subset of that database, just 3,000 samples over, over 20,000 genes. And we're going to project this onto two dimensions. So here's a two-dimensional plot using a PCA that we got from the 20,000 genes. And it still contains the 3,000 samples. And each one is a gray point with some colors, which I'll speak about in a moment. Now, amazingly, across all these samples, we can learn some really interesting things. So the first thing we learn is that tissues of similar um, types localize on this landscape. So as you can see, they're very clear blood, brain, and epithelial clusters here. And in fact, we can even see something more we get that more specific phenotypes also co-localize. So if we just take one level down the epithelial cluster and its samples, and we project them onto a two-dimensional PCA, we get that gastro samples and those associated with reproductive hormones also co-localize. And we have many such examples of this, where we can go further down the hierarchy and see that samples from similar tissue types co-localize. OK, so the interesting thing is if you look at cancer samples, they lie in the same general vicinity as their non-cancerous counterparts, but they're more spread out on this what I call landscape. So our overall goal is to leverage this structure in order to map the transcriptomic landscape. So to do this, we needed a unified approach where we could map samples into their corresponding biomedical phenotypes. So let's say um, lung tissue, or metastatic glioma, or ductal breast tissue. And for that, we constructed a curated machine-readable database that allowed us to map a given gene expression sample to its biomedical phenotypes. To be able to do this, we used the NLM's Unified Medical Language System and mapped gene expression samples up the hierarchy. So having such a data structure where we can quickly retrie retrieve gene expression samples allowed us to be able to do a macroscopic analysis of a large amount of data. So now that we have this data structure, which maps gene expression samples onto their biomedical phenotypes, what can we do with it? Well, one thing we've done with it, here is our data structure, is we take new gene expression samples and we quantify how they map onto our transcriptomic landscape. So we, we, to do this, we developed a concept enrichment score based on Kolmogorov Smirnoff statistics over the concept ontology database. So this statistic allows us to answer the question of given a new gene expression sample, can we accurately label it given the other, the other samples in the database and their labels? And in fact, our ability to correctly label it is quite strong. When we tested this in leave one sample out cross-validation, we got that the average accuracy was 92.8% as measured by the area under the curve of over the 1,209 concepts in our database. So our ability to place gene expression, new gene expression samples on this landscape is, we can do this with confidence. It's strong. So we've developed a web resource based on this. It's called Concordia. And it takes as input a cell file of affymetrics data, expression data, and it returns a rank-ordered list of the concepts most associated with it. And it also returns a plot of where the new sample, which comes from the brain here, falls on this landscape. So the sample we're trying to place is in blue. And we've labeled the other, brands, the other brain samples in the database in orange. And as you can see, it's quite there in the middle of the brain range. And this is our this is our transcriptomic landscape that I showed you on the earlier slide. And we're still looking at the one generated from the 3,000 samples. So 
So as you might imagine, having the full transcriptomic landscape can be really helpful for potential medical diagnoses. So I'm going to give you an example here of one thing we're able to do. So as you know, just because you have cancer in the brain doesn't mean it originated in the brain. And in fact, knowing its tissue of origin can be really helpful for clinical treatment. So by being able to place a new expression sample on this transcriptomic landscape, we're able to do something really important. And this is because in our framework, new, this is because in our framework, samples tend to look more like their tissue of origin than they look like their tissue where they metastasize to. So for example, here we have lung cancer metastases that were biopsied from the brain. And we've highlighted the brain convex hole contour in dark in blue. And these are our lung cancer metastases in orange. And they fall and are, are enriched for the lung, their tissue of origin, much more highly than for the brain. Here we have another example we have where we have breast cancer metastases, and they look a lot more like breast, their tissue of origin, than even lung, which is close by, than bone or brain. And their concept enrichment scores are significantly higher for breast. Now while these are just two examples, we see similar results across a variety of cancers. So not only can we identify the tissue of origin for metastases, we can also identify what genes are most associated with them. So what we want to do is, given a particular biomedical phenotype, we want to identify marker genes that are most associated with it. And the typical way of doing this would be to use case versus control studies. But we're looking at this from an entirely different dimension with our transcriptomic landscape. So what we're asking is what we want to pinpoint the genes that are most related to a particular phenotype and not, let's say, related to a more general phenotype like cancer, such as genes involved in cell cycle and cell adhesion. And in fact, we've developed an approach for identifying marker genes, which I'm not going to get into, but we basically use a finite impulse control control filter over each phenotype. And this allows us to identify the marker genes that are enriched for each particular biomedical phenotype on the UMLS ontology. So in so doing, for example, we're able to get fine ones that are much more particular to breast carcinoma than carcinoma and lobular breast carcinoma. So this brings up a more general study that we did, which answers what my collaborator Zach Kohani calls the insulident dome. So we actually looked at what the marker genes were for carcinoma and the 13 subconcepts in the UMLS hierarchy for which we had data for. And we found that a quarter of the marker genes had higher P marker p values for carcinoma than they did for the more particular concepts here. And this has got to be important when you're designing clinical tests based on marker genes. You don't want to be using the general cancer ones for, let's say, lobular breast carcinoma. So we ran Concordia and our concept enrichment score to identify marker genes across breast cancer genes. And we found that there were 74 that were highly enriched for being unique to breast cancer. Three interesting ones are listed here, which some of you may be familiar with, but they were extremely high scoring and are known to be associated with breast cancer. And when we looked at the GO enrichment, meaning the functional enrichment for the different concepts, we saw that they did not have the common cancer GO terms, but they had, such as cell cycle and cell adhesion, but they had ones very particular to breast cancer. And in addition, we found ones that were related to carbohydrate and lipid metabolism. Now, it's known that women with type 2 diabetes may have higher susceptibility to breast cancer, so this was not surprising. So what we'd like to be able to do is use these databases and systems 
to develop data mining algorithms from which we can understand the macroscopic signals in the data. So in one type such example here, we try to do this for stem cells, like genes. And so what we did here was we looked at, we made a whole new PCA, this time over 200 genes, not our 20,000 genes that we originally started with. And these 200 genes were identified as being the highest scoring marker genes for stem cell likeness. So we still have our 3,000 samples, but we've reduced a 200-dimensional space as opposed to a 20,000 gene dimensional space. And this is the map that we get. And then we can ask ourselves, where do normal gene expression samples, malignant samples, and stem cell-like ones lie on this new landscape? And the striking thing here is that we find that malignant tumor samples such as here for blood, that is like leukemia, lie between the normal tissue samples and the stem cell-like ones. And so from a gene expression perspective, we find that malignant tumor samples retain some of the characteristics and are close to their tissue of origin, but they also adopt some stem cell-like programming. And people have suggested this in various studies, but here we're finding it in terms of analyzing blindly a massive amount of data. So in the, rest, in, in the next few slides, the red area will be the normal tissue samples, the green will be the malignant ones, the purple will be the pluripotent stem cells, the cyan, the immortalized stem cells, the blue, the mesenchymal stem cells, and the yellowish precursor cells where we have them. So this is for blood. We see a similar pattern for colon, where we have the malignant colon tumor samples lying between the normal and the stem cell ones. And notice that the red and the green shaded areas, now corresponding to colon instead of blood, have shifted, which we would expect, whereas the undifferentiated stem cells remain where they are, which we also would hope for. And we're shading them on each of these slides. We get a similar pattern for breast tissue samples and a similar pattern for prostate samples. And taken all together with the addition of brain, we can see an overall such pattern where the malignant tumor samples lie between the normal and the stem cell ones. So you may have observed that all this could kind of be understood through principle component one. But if you look at PC2, it turns out that the shadings of the relative tissues actually reflect their placement on the original whole transcriptomic landscape over the 20,000 genes that I showed you before, whereas these are only the 200 stem cell related genes, and they're recapitulating the placements of the tissues. So in the long run, we would, of course, like for this to have some clinical applications. And we've shown that we can actually shed some insight as to where the primary site is for metastasis. And there are a number of companies working in the space right now. We're hoping that our data-centric approach will provide a nice complement to their methods. We've also shown that we can identify marker genes specific to a disease, and in particular, breast cancer. And we're hoping that these kind of methods may be helpful in you know, clinical tests such as Mammaprint or Oncotype DX in the future. And in preliminary studies, we've also been able to show that tumor grade is correlated with the stem cell landscape that I just showed you. And hopefully, in the long run, this will be helpful in disambiguating mid-grade tumors, which have been so difficult to treat. Oops, sorry, I went. OK. So we've seen that by synthesizing a large gene expression database, we can actually get some, in, some biomedical insights that we would not have been able to get from one particular member of that database. And now what we're going to do is look at how, by using network information, we're going to be able to do cross-species inference 
which we could not get from sequence data alone. So in particular, we're going to focus on protein-protein interaction networks. So these are the species for which we have the most PPI data for. As you can see, these are the number of proteins in each of the species. And these are the currently known numbers of interactions. Of course, for yeast, we have a lot of known interactions, whereas for mouse, we have very few. And here's, in the past, the way we would model PPIs, we would take a very low throughput structure-based approach where at great expense and large amounts of time, we would be able to analyze the structure and chemistry of a particular protein complex. But now, over the last decade or so, there's been a high throughput network-based approach emerging where we model these networks at lower resolution, but we come up with a network which covers the entire species, or at least attempts to cover the entire species. And so in this framework, each protein is a vertex, and each edge represents that we have some evidence for interaction between those proteins. Now this low-level approach is going to allow us to come up with um, insights that we couldn't necessarily get from the low throughput approach, the more detailed structural approach, this low resolution approach. So here's the yeast PPI network, actually the earliest one. And in such a network, every edge is determined by some high throughput technique. So in this case, this edge is determined by yeast to hybrid. Now, fortunately, we have more high throughput techniques coming along. And mass spectrometry, mass spectrometry is a really good one, which is giving us lots of new interaction data recently. But there's a problem with this data. So as you may have guessed from my previous slide, where I talked about the number of proteins in interactions, the coverage is not so great. There are proteins for which we have no information at all as to any of their interactions. And there are also lots of false positives. And each of these high throughput techniques gives a confidence in each of these edges. And we would like to assign better confidences. That's a nice open problem that we're working on. So though these problems lend themselves to combinatorial algorithms, the traditional algorithms that we've had in the past don't apply directly because there are lots of errors in this data. So one thing we can do with this network data is, I noticed that, because <laughs> I have Craig there. Anyway, one thing we can do with this network data is we can compare it across species. So this is what's known as comparative genomics. And I'm sure you're very familiar with it in terms of sequences where we look at biological data across species with the hope that areas of high conservation correspond to functional parts or modules of the genome. So what I'm going to show you here is that by merely looking at protein sequence information, we can't get nearly as good correspondences of genes across species as we can by using sequence information with a network perspective. And in fact, my group, I just grabbed this picture from somewhere, but we did some of the earliest work in this area where we compared the human and mouse genomes working with Eric Lander and the original four yeast genomes. Manolis Kellis was my student, and we worked with Eric Lander. And I've also helped on the Fly Mod and Code project, comparing information across genomes. But we've since turned this to comparing networks. And one reason we'd want to compare networks is we'd want to be able to better transfer annotation from one species to another. So let's say you knock out a gene in a mouse and it grows three years. You've learned something about what that gene does, but you wouldn't want to do that in humans. And so we need a mechanism to transfer information from model organisms among model organisms and to humans. And one terminology for this is orthology. 
And orthology means the correspondence between genes and, in this, and proteins used interchangeably here across species. But what we want is we want functional orthology, a term coined by Trey Eidecker and Rajesh Sharan. And what this means is that we want proteins which actually perform the same function across species. And this is a very important problem. I'm working with biologists right now who are very frustrated with the sequence-only based methods that have been traditionally used for this. And they want to use other information to get better correspondences because the sequence-based methods tend to get lots of false positives. And then they're not getting correct answers. So as I said, I'm going to show you that by using sequence and network information, we can get much better mappings between genes across species. So the problem we have is given two protein-protein interaction networks, we want to find for a piece of one network something that has comparative structure in the other network. So for any particular pair of nodes, one from the fly green network and one from the yeast blue network, we want to score how similar they are based on sequence and network. So for a given node here in the fly, we want to know which nodes here in the yeast have similar function. So the way that we do this is we match neighborhood topologies. So this is going to get a little algorithmic right now because I I'm a computational biologist, but you'll see. Um, so we developed the Isorank algorithm a few years ago. And it's the first algorithm to do global network alignment. And it's the first algorithm that uses this idea of matching neighborhood topologies. And I'm, give, I'm, I'm going to give you a little intuition as to how it works. So the heart of the algorithm is how we compute these similarity scores between a node in one network and a node in the other. So we're gonna, these scores are going to be RIJ scores, where RA5B1 is the similarity score between A5 in the blue network and B1 in the green network. And we're going to get a high score if the two nodes are a good match, if I and J are a good match. So the intuition that we pursue is that I and J are a good match if their sequences align and their neighbors are a good match. So in the past, this quote unquote functional similarity score, RIJ, was based merely on sequence similarity. And as I said, that leads to a lot of false positives. So what we're going to do is we're going to add a network component to this, NIJ, which is a similarity score between the neighbors of nodes i and j. And then rij is going to be a convex combination of a sequence similarity score and a network similarity score. And notice that alpha is user defined, although we recommend a setting. And if it's alpha is 1, then you have no sequence data. And if alpha is 0, you have no network data in this equation. So in sum, the isorank algorithm takes as input two networks, a blue and a green, and it produces a mapping of all the nodes in the blue networks to all the nodes in the green networks, network. And this mapping is just this matrix R, which consists of the RIJ scores, the similarity scores. And notice that this matrix is pretty empty. That's because lots of the pairwise similarity scores are zero. So as I said, and in a little more detail, what we want to compute is the sequence similarity score plus the neighborhood similarity scores. We want that the neighbors of similar nodes are also similar. And this is measured by a weighted sum over the similarity scores of the neighbors of i and j, which are RUV. Now the trouble is, is that we don't know the RUV values of the neighbors, the similarity scores of the neighbors, until we know, until we've computed them. So it turns out that it's not so much a problem because this is a linear system of equations that we can just solve as an eigenvalue problem. And in fact, we can solve it efficiently because these R matrices are so sparse. So this eigenvalue formulation lends itself to a random walk interpretation. 
And in this, we have a blue graph G1 and a green graph G2. And our problem is just taking a random walk on the tensor product graph of G1 and G2 such that the transition probability out of any given product node UV is the same. It's equivalent for all the out edges of that node. And this is precisely the term on our network similarity score. Here we're looking at a simpler case where we're not looking at the sequence information in the, network, in the similarity score computation, just for ease of explanation. So, and as it turns out that the stationary distribution of this random walk is just the largest eigenvalue of the matrix that's n squared by n squared in size, which you get as a result of the transition probabilities in this matrix here. Now, this may remind you of an algorithm that's out there. Um, Google's PageRank algorithm does a similar random walk on a single graph rather than a product of graphs to rank web pages in order of importance. So an even harder problem is multiple network alignment. And the reason this is so hard is the same reason as for multiple sequence alignment is that the problem is exponential in the number of networks. So basically, we want to find, given multiple networks, some conserved structure between them. So as for the case of sequence alignment, we're going to approximate this with pairwise network alignments. And the pairwise network alignments are precisely the R matrices that I just showed you. So this would be the R matrix for comparing the purple network with the green network, and this would be the one for the green with the yellow network. And our quote unquote orthologs are going to be the highly weighted subgraphs for these, for this computation. So notice that we're allowing one such good alignment would be one node from the purple, one node from the green, and two from the yellow, because we can have gene duplication events. So we want that our orthologies are clusters rather than one-to-one -one mappings across these. So very quickly, this is how this works. We compute a similarity graph between all pairs of networks. And then what we do is we want to find strongly similar neighbors. So we start with a particular node, let's say this red one here in Arnold, and we want to find strongly similar neighbors to that. So the idea that we're using here is that if multiple pairs of networks agree that something, that, that nodes are related, or if proteins are related, then the, then the other network even if we don't have an edge there, it's probable, they're probably related in that too. Although, of course, in biology, there could be exceptions. But basically, we're hoping that in this cluster, most of the edges have high score. So then we find a strongly similar neighbor to the red one in Arnold. And in fact, what we really want is a highly weighted subset of that. Because that means that most of the correspondences across species agree that these, that these are important and they have the same function. And for this, we use the PageRank Nibble algorithm, where we start with a red node, and we have a random walk with a teleport back to that node. This will be done soon, <laughs> the technical part. <laughs> anyway, so we get, we get a couple of such PageRank Nibble type um, subgraphs, highly weighted subgraphs. And then if they have a lot of edges in common, we merge them, as they do here. And then we remove them from the graph on the next slide, hence nibble, and then repeat. So that's the algorithm. And that allows us to do multiple network alignment, or at least approximate it with pairwise network alignment. So how does this do? Well, the trouble in this field is that there's no gold standard database for measuring orthology. It's, it's actually 
a huge problem. There are just no gold standards. So what we did was we came up with our own measure called normalized entropy. And what we wanted was that we said that things that are orthologs should probably have very similar GOAT enrichment terms. They should pretty much be doing similar functions. So we came up with an entropy term, which also required, well, as part of entropy, you want that there are fewer nodes that more have the same function than lots of different functions. You, don't want, you want fewer functions is what I meant to say. So by normalized entropy, or the mean normalized entropy, we were able to do better than the two top sequence orthology prediction algorithms, homology in ortho-MCL, for both for all species and on just human and fly. So ISO rank N is our multiple network alignment um, program. We were also able to get good coverage, especially for three or more species. As you can see here, the, the best results are, are bold-faced. And we were able to do better than there's some network alignment algorithms out there that do local alignment, such as Network Blast and, and Gremlin. And we were able to do better than those as well, but I'm not showing those results here. So we developed a database, ISOBase, which was in the NAR database issue last, last summer. And what it does is it takes in a gene or protein ID or any, actually, all sorts of different types of IDs. And it tells you the orthologs in the five species or some subset thereof that I just spoke about. And it also gives you a lot of other information about the orthologs and links to other databases that contain information about those orthologs. So I'll put up one biological application we've been able to get using ISOBase. So we work with the Sue Lindquist lab, and they use yeast models to understand things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's disease. And this example is going to be related to genes involved in toxicity in Parkinson's. So Sue gave us a list of these genes in yeast, and she wanted to know what are genes that are likely having the same function in humans. So we were able to use isobase and find this gene here and many others that I'll tell you about in a minute, but in particular this gene here, we found to be on a pathway that was involved in ER to Golgi vesicle mediated transport. And it turns out that when you knock, when you overexpress alpha synuclein, a protein which is really important in Parkinson's disease, that this pathway, pathway is disrupted. So we have some evidence that that gene is doing something related to Parkinson's. And in fact, using isobase, we were able to find 48 human orthologs to her yeast counterparts, and 24 of them were entirely new. They weren't found by any of the other orthology predictors out there, the sequence-based ones or the network-based ones. So we have lots of applications of ISO, ISO rank and isobase. As you saw a few of these already. People have also used it for metabolic network alignment. And we were able to do genetic interaction network alignment, and we make that available in isobase. So as I've talked about today, we saw how better algorithms can make problems more tractable across various areas, and they can allow us to gain insights that we otherwise would not have been able to get. But this is a very small fraction, actually, of what we currently work on. And I'm just going to name a few of our recent software that we've put out to give you an idea of the other things that we work on. We also have done a lot of work in protein structure prediction. In fact, we developed this program, MAT, for protein structure alignment. And in an independent review article, it was deemed to be the best program for protein structure alignment. We also do ensemble modeling, whether to predict structure or to predict folding pathways of structures. We work on amyloid prediction with Sue Lindquist and have recently published the Amyloid Mutants program, which predicts mutants of amyloids and their structures, as well as amyloid prediction. And we continue to work in coil coils just putting out 
newer versions of our original programs. We also work on predicting non-coding RNA structure and locations of microRNAs in sequence data. So we have a couple program, RNA mutants, where, which predicts mutational effects of, um, on the structure of RNAs. And we have a new program, Reaper, which is appearing in Recom, which predicts non-coding RNA structure of medium to large RNAs. But to highlight here, we've done a couple pieces of work on microRNA prediction. And one has the Minotaur program, which looks for microRNA targets in ORFs. And we find that, surprisingly, they're much more prevalent in ORFs than was believed in the past. And in fact, they're as prevalent as in the three prime UTR sites. And just last summer, Nature Reviews Genetics highlighted some of our work where we found in another paper in genome research that microRNA targeting targets sequence repeats in ORF regions that were previously not known to be targeted and may suggest roles in regulation. And we teamed up with David Bartel for this, and he did experiments to confirm this in humans. So we also work on all sorts of biological networks. We have structure-based PPI prediction tools where we take two protein sequences and predict their structure. And we also work on signaling network reconstruction and we also integrate these structure-based predictions with systems-wide data, which we've been doing for years. We work on signaling network reconstruction and metabolic network analysis. I know this sounds funny to a biologist to work on so many different things, but we're applying computational techniques to biological problems. So I want to thank the people in my group. The compressive genomics work was done by two of my grad students at the time, Michael Baim's now a postdoc at HMS, um, Po Rulo and Michael Baim. And the medical genomics work was done by Nathan Palmer, Patrick Schmidt. They were both students of mine. Now they're both, Nathan's already at HMS and Patrick's going there, and Zach Kohani in conjunction with him at HMS. And the biological network work was done with Rohit Singh did ISORANK with some help from Jinbo Zhu. And ISO Rank N was done by Michael Baim, Chung Shou Lo, and Kenny Liu. And Danny Park helped do the ISO based database. And I also want to thank a whole bunch of others who I collaborate with and have been instrumental in this work. Thank you. Thanks for a very stimulating and broad ranging uh, presentation. Uh, the floor is open for questions. The microphone's in the aisles, so please use those if you have a question to pose. Yes, sir. I wonder if you would speculate uh, whether um, comparing uh, networks associated with toxicology or toxicity of one kind or another in the types of animals used for testing novel pharmaceuticals uh, could be applied to assessing not so much when the networks are similar in humans, which are cases where the animal tests would predict human toxicities accurately, but where they're not. Is that too way out and speculative? Uh, no, no, no. That, that, I mean, we have, you know, P scores for each of these similarities. And also, in that case, I would think you should look at modules Indeed. as well as yes. particular node correlations, but no, that would be completely doable. The, where, the, the problem, but the problem is if you're missing data, you don't know that it's not so. And there's probably a lot of missing data. There's, there's a huge issue of, of late failures uh, in drug development because uh, tox issues were not identified at an early stage. It seems like this could be an incredibly valuable approach to doing just that. Yeah, I would love to talk to you about that. That sounds interesting. Over here. Yeah, so I really liked uh, the PCA plots with all the different samples and how you were able to stratify uh, everything. But I'm very curious, um, you only showed the first two principal components, if there are other principal components that also gave information. But also the other part is um, if you looked at uh, independent component analysis or uh, multi-dimensional multi scaling, if that gave you any more information or less information. Uh, on the, well, all we, those samples? We did look at more components. They're hard to 
put on here. Of course. For the level that we're working at right now, we didn't need them, but I, I, there was definitely more data when you went out to a few more dimensions. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't know about the multi-dimensional gotcha. testing. Okay. Bonnie, in that same analysis uh, where you were doing the leave one out experiment to see whether, in fact, the data sets map back to where they should based upon their cellular basis of origin, I think you said you got it right about 92.8% of the time. It would be interesting to look at the ones where you didn't get it right, because there might be some interesting biology there. If a data set didn't land where you would expect, maybe that data set worth some investigation. What was that, anyway? Did you do any of that to try to assess? You know, you're, you're speaking like a true biologist. They always want to know the cases where the computational techniques don't work. Exactly. That's, but, but we, <laughs> You know, we didn't. We were just trying to validate, but that is a very good point. But yeah, it, it also could be a lot of that could just be erroneous mapping. Could be, right. I mean, because or, a lot of the samples are probably mislabeled and may have ended up, there may be you you know, think? noise in the data. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we had to curate this 3,000 sample set. We had to really look at it to get our curated machine readable <laughs> database. It was, it was kind of a nightmare. But now that we have the 3,000, we've been able to run it automatically to get a lot more to kind of characterize tens of thousands of more samples. So we don't only have 3,000 now. <laughs> anyway. Another question? Yeah, if you don't mind. So um, the, again, the PCA map was very similar to Barabasi's map, where he has his Barabasi disease network. Can you show, can you at least um, explain some of the similarities between the Barabasi network and what you've done? as well? Well, the Barabasi network. I don't know which Barabasi network you're talking about. Uh, he has disease, a lot of them. The, the, basically, the disease network, so, you know, where you showed. What uh, diseases are related? Well, we're basically, right. we're not showing disease relationships. We're kind of highlighting, you know, similar tissues, and then we're placing disease samples on the samples on those maps. So you're basing it on tissues. and then We're basing where, it on tissues. I see. I see. And we're giving you the phenotypic concepts that those tissues are, I mean, that those samples are most enriched for. Okay. So, so how, how big a problem is missing data for your functional orthology analysis? It seems like you can't really go there unless you have a pretty complete data set. It is, you are so right. It is a big problem, especially if you're trying to do mouse data. Now, fortunately, we can adjust the alpha parameter and we can weight the sequence data more in the cases where we don't have the network data. But that's why we also went to genetic interaction data, because we had a lot more of that. Got it. Thank you. Good question. Well, uh, this has been a fascinating conversation. You all are welcome to come down front if you want to consider the conversation with Bonnie. I'm sorry to say our reception uh, doesn't seem to be happening in the library, but you're welcome <laughs> to speak with the uh, presenter here down front. Let us thank our presenter one more time. Thank you, Dr. Berger. <laughs>